So yeah, thanks for this invitation, thanks for the opportunity to speak, and thanks to all of you for coming here. I'm Mirko Böhm, I um, represent the Open Invention Network, which is a, a patent pool that uh, protects Linux and, and other key free and open source software technologies from patent litigation through cross-licensing. And many Nordic companies are part of our network. Basically, when you're in the network, you're cross-licensing your patent portfolio to all the others in the network, and that very effectively suppresses all sorts of patent litigation. So, if you're ever wondering why we have um, almost absolutely no patent litigation when it comes to the kernel and the C library, etc., I think we're one part of that. Um, however, uh, since I already presented about this three years ago, and at least a few of you were there, I'm not going into more detail here, um, I think it's it's actually good to, to open Force North with a topic that is clearly related to free and open source software, but also slightly on the fringe and um, involves well the non-technical aspects of our community. Because um, may I ask into the room who of you has ever had to deal with patents in open source? Two, three, nice. Standardization, standards development. One, two, three, four, a little more. But you see, this is a topic that um, touches what we do. It interacts very strongly with what we do. And when you imagine yourself in a position of a policymaker in Brussels for the European Union, then you realize that this is one of the, the questions that they're asking themselves is, what do we do with these different ways of, of managing innovation? Because that's essentially what it is. Um, it's, a different, it's a difficult topic. Um, to set the scene, I wanted to begin with, give, with giving you a collection of super idealistic mission statements. Um, just so that um, you see that actually the problem is weird in a way. So, ISO, you all know ISO, right? The, the International Organization for Standardization, which is not an abbreviation of ISO, it's actually the Greek word for equal. You might know that. So, the name of the organization is not an abbreviation. Um, and anyway, so ISO brings together experts to share knowledge and develop voluntary, consensus-based, market-relevant international standards that support innovation and provide solutions to global challenges. Beautiful mission, right? He's a typical representative of the, the free and open source software community. The Linux Foundation is dedicated to building sustainable ecosystems around open source projects to accelerate technology development and industry adoption. Wonderful. The European Patent Office right, says, the mission of the European Patent Office is to support innovation, competitiveness, and economic growth for the benefit of the citizens of Europe. <laughs> right, so you ask yourself, why could there possibly be any sort of discord between these groups? They all want the same, right? They all want, in the end, they all have the public good in mind, they say. Um, so, there's some tension. So here's some quotes. There's an organization that represents major uh, intellectual property holders, patent holding companies, IP for, uh, for IP Council. And um, one quote from a recent publication is, one solution to the concerns raised about the incompatibility between standard setting organizations and uh, fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory uh, patent licensing conditions is for friend-based SDOs, standard development organizations, to amend relevant open source licenses to ensure that they are compatible with the SDO's intellectual property rights policies. If you come from a background in, in the wider open source community like I do, that sounds horribly offensive to you, right? And here's a response from uh, CyberFib's open source initiative. This is basically four or two weeks old. Uh, debating the legal compatibility of open source licenses with royalty bearing patents in standards is beside the point. One needs to either use a real open source project um, or risk that no one shows up apart from standardizers, Simon Phipps. So you see, there's quite some tension. These, both these publications are not old, they are, I think, from this year. Um, and there's an ongoing study on the interaction between open source software and friend licensing and standardization at the Joint Research Center for the European Commission. And uh, I'm working on a study, so um, together with researchers from TU Berlin. Um, and so basically, this is what I want to talk about today: this tension, um, because we're 
We're experiencing a, a new round of what you might recall as the software patents debate from, I think it's almost 15 years ago now, right? Roughly 2005, remember there were boats going down the river in Brussels with um, billboards on them saying no software patents? Does anybody remember that? You should look it up. It's, it was actually pretty spectacular. <laughs> um, and the software patents debate has ebbed, mostly because it's not a super popular topic. It's very dry. It's patents and, 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 and economic policy and stuff like that. So it's not something that gets uh, a large group like this super enthusiastic, which is why I rub it in a little bit so that you see this is relevant. Um, so, so what is the interest in this subject? I mean, if we would say, okay, there's tension, let it go. Here's a quote from the European Commission's communication on the role of standard central patents in, in Europe where they say integration between open source projects and standards development processes is a win-win situation. On one side, the alignment of open source and standardization can speed up the standards development process and the take-up of ICT standards, especially for SMEs, and on the other side, standards can provide for interoperability of open source software implementations. So, this is a policy statement that you know how long it takes to write a policy statement. Right? So, if the European Commission in 2017 put this out, uh, you can imagine that there is a lot of pressure to actually establish collaboration between standards development organizations and the, the wider open source community, which automatically brings in the question of patents, etc., because many of the participants in, in standards development hold portfolios of patents that read on the standards that are being developed. These are called standard central patents. So there, um, there's also an underlying reason, which I like to say in this room, and that is that the open source community in general out-innovates and out-collaborates the standards development organizations. Um, I'll show you some numbers later where, about like, how many participants we have some, in some of the, the larger projects. And um, it dwarfs, literally dwarfs, even the larger collaborations of standards development organizations. So you may have like 100 participants there or a couple hundred, and you may have 10,000 in, in a larger open source project. So um, there are some like Official reasons why we would like to see collaboration, but there's also like a puzzled face saying, why are they so much faster than we are? So congratulations to all of you for doing that. Um, so there are two essential parts of the presentation. This was all introduction. Um, one is about this, which is a study we did at the Technic University of Berlin. And the second part is about the, the study that we're doing for the Joint Research Center, which are two separate things. Here, we first looked at, if we assume that there's this tension, where does it come from? Shouldn't there be partners? I mean, that's what you would expect from the um, idealistic commission statements. But maybe, because they're new institutions and it's essentially a competition between institutions for relevance, right? Maybe they're competitors, maybe they displace each other in some parts, and that creates the tension. So we tried to answer this question. And the first thing we ran into was a super antiquated view of standard. And this, again, sounds very offensive to the standards development people, because that's their definition of standard. Um, it's even, there's even a standard on this. So there's a standard that says what the standard is. It's the uh, ISO IEC Guide 2, 2004. And it says the standard is a document established by consensus and approved by a recognized body, recognized is important here, that provides for common repeated use, rules, guidelines, and characteristics Mm -hmm. It aimed at the at achieving uh, the optimum degree of order in a given context. So very generic, but a couple of key terms in this. One is document. This is called the document-centric view of standards. It's a piece of paper or a PDF, but you know you can print it. Um, established by consensus means as a the, the age-old question of consensus. Yeah, but by whom? And who's involved? And uh, so it's a yin-yang question of who's in and who's out. Um, and then approved by a recognized body. Now you need to understand here that recognized bodies are recognized standards development organizations. So for example, some of them are uh, recognized by the European Union. Or some, they are national standards organizations in every country uh, that are recognized by the local governments. So basically this defines a standard as a standard is what standards development organizations produce. Uh, what you all do is not standardization. Even if you achieve massive standardization, in the sense that 
Let's say we produce an operating system that runs on 99.9% .9 of the computers in the world, which is the definition of standardization, right? You're not doing standardization because you don't produce a document that is approved by consensus and by a recognized body. So we said, yeah, yeah, that, that might be true. And maybe in the 70s, some, some committee got together and put this, docu this uh, definition into an, an ISO standard. Um, this doesn't explain how the freedom to software community develops software and then develops this into a standard. So we need a better way. So we developed this. It's called a standardization phase model. It's basically a view, a dynamic view of on standardization, where we say um, standardization is a process in society that starts with a need for standardization. So we perceive, for example, oh, all our plugs and power plugs on our computers, they don't fit into the other computers. So there's a need for standardization. And we are looking for a technical solution to fulfill that. And uh, actually, we don't care necessarily if that's defined by a standards development organizations or if all the laptop manufacturers get together um, and just agree on what the plug should look like. Right? We say if the result is that my laptop charger can plug into your laptop to charge, we have achieved the standard. So that's the need and then the adoption of a standard. And to get from A to B, um, we apply a sort of standardization instrument which is something that causes a standardizing effect. Um, and if it, this may sound totally logical, but it's very much against the going theory in standardization, especially when standards development organizations are involved. Especially because we define the whole thing as a process. The process has four phases. Ideation is where you find possible standards. Um, basically, this is this exploration phase where you like the different open source communities. They're competing over. Everybody starts a project. Uh, don't take photos yet. There will be more. <laughs> um, everybody starts a project. There are like probably five IoT frameworks at the moment per week, I guess. Uh, but there will be a hashing out process. So over time, we will. This will reduce. This will kind of like a good sauce, right? It cooks and then it reduces to what is really good. And then you maybe have two, and that's when standards begin to develop. And then you ask yourself a question, do we create a specification or do we implement? And what, which of these two do we do first? Because if you want an interoperable framework, you probably need documentation. There is a very, very interesting talk on documentation later today that you want to hear. And, um, and that's basically the specification of the technology. If you want to achieve interoperability, if you want to achieve adoption, with, uh, within other communities that you don't have a personal connection to, you need specifications. So you may say, okay, so now we have, we have decided on what the standard should be. Let's write a specification so that we can then have multiple ideally compatible implementations that then lead to diffusion in, in the market. Make sense? This is more like the classical way of, of thinking about standardization, if you will. Um, because you can easily imagine this not being necessarily done in an open source community, but in a working group at Send Sendelec, saying, let's define the API for our IoT frameworks, and then the communities can go and, and implement them. Um, so that's, that's actually very compatible, only that today you see that even the specification part is sometimes done within open source communities. So we don't necessarily resort to standards development organizations. We do this ourselves. Um, but you need all four phases. If you, you see that already, right? You, you need to come up with the idea, you need to specify it, you need to implement it, and then you can reach diffusion in the market. This is also possible. It's basically the exact opposite approach. It's to say, we have this idea, but we don't want to specify it in the start, from the start, because if we do that, then we're, we're basically stopping innovation at this point, because as soon as you have described how things should work, it's difficult to change how they work. So let's continue implementing. Let's write more code, let's get more functionality in, and, and wait for adoption in the industry. And when things have hashed out really well, then we write a specification. So you implement first, and then you specify. And this is more in line with how, how the free and open software community develops. Right? We, we typically lead by implementation. I mean, we don't necessarily write specifications first. Um, well, naturally, this is like theory, but at least this model explains the processes of standards development organization and open source communities in the same model, which the old definition of a standard as a document written by SDO didn't really do. In real life, it looks more messy like this. 
So, um, for multiple reasons. Um, first of all, it's not a linear process, it's repetitive. So you make a first version and then you go back and make another version and the old specification you throw away, you do it again. Um, in, in the more standards driven world, you often have situations where vendors already create products while the standard, uh, standard development process is still ongoing. Uh, for good reasons sometimes, because you want to be able to introduce products in the market at the time a standard is published. Um, you see this with USB, you saw that with um, some video connectors, I think HDMI was one of them, where there was like intermediate phase of incompatible implementations that they would then fix, um, and some others. So it's, it's actually, like this is probably the most common, the parallel approach to, to standardization is most common in real life, but the other two are illustrative for understanding how this, this environment really works. Um, so yeah, so we said, okay, so this is a face model, but now we have to kind of analyze the, the, the real situation in the ICT sector. And we came up with this process, which is a comparative SWOT analysis. Who has heard of SWOT before? That's quite, quite popular, like strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Um, when you learned about it, were you told that you can't compare SWOT analysis? Yes, no, nobody? It's, it's the keystone of the theory of SWOT is that it's an analysis of a specific situation um, used to derive recommendations for actions. But you can't compare one to the other because all the four segments of the analysis are separate. They're different from each other. There's no connection between two separate ones. But here's what we did. We said open source communities and standards development organizations in the ICT sector operate against the same opportunities and threats. They operate in the same market. So if you do that, you anchor these two separate analyses together, which I try to very nicely visualize this way. Um, and this leads to super interesting results. Um, actually surprising, I think, but you will see. So the first thing that we did based on that is we, we did two separate analyses, put them together and said, what is if you condensed your opportunities and threats in the ICT sector, what comes out of that? This is super relevant to you because this is the, the sector, the space that you work in, that your business operates in. So let's see. There are two key changes. This is not surprising, right? There's digitization and globalization that really, really change how our sector works. Um, and we brought it down to four essential changes that really change our environment. One is that we created very much improved methods of collaboration. Um, we all know that because we come from an open source background, but if you, if you want to see how drastic this change is, uh, think back just a few years, maybe 10, maybe 12, when you will still order books with specifications. Do any of you still do that? The ones that, like me, have gray hair may remember that. Um, there was a time before PDFs were available for everything. Right? That's not too long ago. Um, we can coordinate development work with online tools globally. And what today feels just like a really fun way to develop software was revolutionary maybe 10 years ago. And it was pioneered by the open source community. I mean, the, the first like online bug trackers that were fully available to, in, in online repositories were hosted by open source communities. So, um, and this changes a lot because many of our institutions that we are that we're relying on, for example, standards development organizations, they were designed around the fact that collaboration is difficult and time consuming. So, it's a, they were designed in a way, for example, that you establish a working group that meets twice a year because that was the most efficient way at the time for different industry stakeholders, etc., to collaborate. Um, and, and today this feels outdated to us, but we have to keep in mind that this wasn't too long ago. Right? The internet as such and, and, and online documents that we can collaboratively edit, that's like the last decade. Right? Before that, people were actually printing meeting minutes and sending them out by mail still. And you might still find some organizations do that today, so it's not... Yeah. Um, that was part one. Part two is a, a general trend towards openness and transparency. And uh, this is like preaching to the choir because we're sitting here and then we know to a software conference. Um, but it has become pretty natural to us that we expect, if somebody introduces a product, we expect to be able to, see, to be able to see the source code. Right? If somebody comes to some sort of agreement 
of, um, for example, which technical direction we should take, we totally expect that the process, how this agreement was reached, is documented somewhere. Maybe that the meeting minutes are available. Maybe that actually, as it should be, the discussion happens on IRC and the logs are publicly available. Um, if you would ask this maybe 10, 15 years ago, you would get a lot of blank stares because people say, how can you, how can you discuss like that, right? If everybody can, can go in the room, you use a small group, and they need to reach a consensus, ideally a back room so that I can like, pay off two of these people and the other one I invite for dinner and then I get my opinion through, right? And, and this is a change that we don't just see in technology, we also see this in politics, um, in education, in many other places. But it's definitely apparent in the ICT sector. So, um, for example, there was a very cozy relationship between, especially standards development organizations and regulators, um, where you develop a standard and the standard is then basically imposed as a safety regulation. So you say you have to be at least according to this standard to be able to sell this. Fine as long as the standard is open. But if it's a closed standard or proprietary standard or a standard that involves patents that cover it, then you basically create a license to print money. Right? And, and this happened. And this trend works against this, where um, we increasingly expect to be able to reproduce in a way how certain decisions are made, who took part in that decision, where you expect that if there's an organization, how can I become part of the organization should be public and transparent? Um, what is my role as a contributor? Do I have the same rights as somebody else? Etc. Remember, for example, how non disclosure no, non agreements, uh, computer license agreements, contributor license agreements, have become much less popular recently because they created asymmetric situations between contributors that we think, we in intuitively feel, are against this trend. Yeah. You can look this up, there are lots of debates about this. Then there's a, a third F aspect, this is all based on uh, digitization. This is the a shift of relevance from, from national to super international collaboration regulation. This basically is how we work, right? You don't care if your contributors come from Asia, South America, or Europe. As long as somebody submits a good patch, we're happy about it. Um, but that's a big change because, um, the, for example, the standards development world is organized in national standards bodies that form a hierarchy. Then there are some European ones. Then there's the International Organization for Standardization that kind of integrates that. But it's very much based on national borders still today. There's a lot of collaboration between these organizations, but they're you know, basically built like the, the old world order. It's still set up the same way. So um, there's a shift towards reducing this kind of redundancy and developing technical decisions or ways to collaborate. And this, of course, threatens the institutions that we have, because if you say, why should I have like 25 national standards organizations in, in the European Union? Well, you see a lot of people going scared because they have five years to retirement. Right? So. Um, and then the last one, this is super interesting, and you may disagree with this, because I didn't invent it. Um, there's a shift in, in the role of the modern state, states we live in, where not too long ago, the state was a major producer of goods. It ran the rail services, it runs education in most places still, and it, it controlled most of the agricultural production, etc., etc. And this is changing. The, the state is more and more a regulator and a coordinator and not a producer. And you can tell why, in, in, in European states especially, there are fewer and fewer people employed by the state in actual production functions. And uh, this is a trend that was actually um, identified and formulated by, by Jean Tirol, and he got a Nobel Prize for it a couple of years ago. So I claim proof by authority, read his book, if you disagree with me on this one. Um, but this is an important change, because if you think about how um, the technical decisions on, for example, technical investments were made in the past, um, a lot of them were made by the state. Which telecommunications network we run? Almost all telecoms operators in the past were operated by the state or owned by the state. Right? And this changes today. Um, and this, this, all these, these four trends together um, are the, the changes, the massive trends that influence how actors in the ICT sector well, basically adopt to their environment. And this includes the Open Source Committee, 
and standards development organization. So the next step naturally was to say, so if in this environment, against these trends, what are the strengths and weaknesses of the wider open source community? When I say the wider open source community, what this means is the, the whole upstream downstream network, right? From the kernel developer all the way to the user with all the thousands of relationships in between, all the communities. Um, it's not surprising what came out as strengths, but we wrote this article also a little bit to document this for the standards development organizations, right? So rapid prototyping. We have tons of projects that start same similar ideas, different programming languages, different implementation approaches, different backing, funding, different experience levels, and then some of these start to, to condense and start to become larger and, and bigger. And this is a huge strength of us because we weed out non-feasible technical solutions in a very early stage. Right? Somebody has this great idea after the third gin and tonic on the weekend, starts something and then one day realizes, man, maybe it wasn't that good. But how do I get rid of that tattoo? Um, and then you stop the project. And then you have another project that continues. And this, this is really a strength. And this combines with the release early, release often model. We make our changes available to the world pretty much on when we finish them, you push your changes to GitHub, they're available to everybody. Um, and that, that creates, that kind of supports this collaboration model um, and this trend to openness, etc. Uh, we have voluntary participation. This, by the way, is one of the keystones, again, of, of how open source works. Because you can't force anybody to work on your project. So there are two things that this means. One is, your project needs to be technically interesting, promising. Right? People need to have a feeling that if they contribute to your project that they will be either able to solve their technical problems really well or um, become famous. Why not? Um, but as this is also a question related to governance in your community. Basically, in plain terms, if the people that run the community act like dicks, other people won't join. And that's good, right? Um, it's a regulator um, on our community and how it behaves. And I think this is one of the reasons why in general the open source community is actually rather welcoming to people that are just interested in contributing. Um, we also have to keep in mind, and this is one of the weaknesses that I will talk about later, that there might be some um, bias in this, in this voluntary participation. And then what, our key strength, I think, is the upstream downstream model. Does everybody understand what this term means? Or have you heard it before? Who has heard it before? Yeah, thank you. This is good. Um, Essentially, there is an unimaginable amount of relationships between contributors and users and, and users in the sense of other communities that use your code, change it, integrate it again, etc. And if any of that would require any sort of negotiation, where you say, I need to call that guy from the other community to see if they can use our code, everything would break down immediately, right? Because we have an end-to-end -end relationship and in faculty relationships in total, and you just don't have that many phone lines to sort this out, right? Um, and every, every license relationship in this model is automatic. We know that, right? Open source licenses mean I offer, you accept, done. We don't have to ever talk to each other. And this is a huge change because it enables collaboration at a scale that wasn't possible before. Um, yeah, but we also have weaknesses. Um, this might be hard to hear, but yes, we do. Uh, we have a strong weakness in supply chain management. This might not be something that is super visible at the level of the individual community, but um, if you look at recent projects, like the Open Chain project, um, if you look at what the SPDX community does, um, they're trying to define basically recommendations for how to manage supply chain in the sense of large code deliveries from one entity to the next that include a combination of uh, free software and proprietary software. And there's a lot of ongoing work of this at the time. Uh, now, which means this is an unsolved problem. Um, we have a huge issue with license compliance. Um, I'm not sure if, if this is also something that at the level of the people that contribute to the code is really visible. Um, it's also a sign of success because it happens to be a problem because we have so much adoption of what we create. Um, but there are projects, I don't know if you heard about, clearly defined, which is like an online repository of identifying the the licenses of, of old components that we're using, where maybe the maintainers have long left. Um, there are multiple projects to, uh, to develop tooling, to document compliance, to, um, or, or to document how software is handed over from one uh, 
produce it to the next, etc. Um, and this is a legal issue, or a legal process issue, it's not technical. And then we have a very limited understanding of meritocracy. And this is harsh, I know, um, because we, have, we understand meritocracy as a positive thing in, in, in the free software community, right? Have you heard of the term meritocracy? Do you consider it like a basic tenet of how we work? Yes. Yeah, good. Do you realize that meritocracy is a super... Um, I'm looking for the word. Um, controversial term? Yeah, because meritocracy has a massive selection bias. It basically means if you fit into the group, you can contribute. If you can't, not because you can't write code, but maybe you speak a different language, or maybe you want to focus on documentation, um, then you don't, aim, you don't uh, earn enough merit in the organization to ever become an influential person in the group. And this is why all our software engineers in the open source community are young, white, well-educated male, including me. So, yeah. Um, meritocracy, we understand it as everybody should be measured against the quality of their contributions, but we measure the contributions that are code a lot higher than the rest of the contributions. Organizing a conference, yeah, thank you, Johan. Writing documentation, sorting out legal issues, mentoring new developers without ever committing any code yourself, but helping 10 other people to join your community. These are all invisible tasks that never show up in your Git logs. And then people look at their Git stats and say, my key contributors are these five developers. This is our limited understanding of meritocracy. So that, that's not supposed to sound gloom. It's, I think it's just natural that we should also have weaknesses, right? So work on it. Make it better. And the others have strengths and weaknesses too, so we shouldn't be bad about it. Um, actually, it might sound strange from our perspective, but standard setting organizations are very established and powerful and, and, and actually useful institutions. They have processes that have developed over a long period of time. And for example, they have gone through all the, the clearing of, for example, if I collaborate with my competitors, is this collusion? Do antitrust authorities actually worry about us collaborating and maybe controlling the market? And they develop processes and negotiate it with antitrust um, watchdogs to make sure that, and basically develop frames of reference to say, this, if we do it this way, and this transparent, and we document what we do this way, and we are open for participation, then it's okay. And, and that's something that we don't have, right? Has there any of you ever discussed antitrust concerns with your local regulators for open source development? No? It's actually being discussed at antitrust regulators because we have such strong collaboration between all market actors. So we have collusion. The question is, is it anti-competitive? Um, they have very well-defined policies for intellectual property rights management. Now, this is always a term when we hear it, we go like, ooh, right? But it exists. Copyright exists, trademark exists, patents exist. And um, we have a good way to manage the copyright in our code and the relationships between our contributors, the communities, the users, etc. Um, but we, comparatively, we're kind of in, in kids' boots still um, when it comes to every other thing. Um, the reach of standard certain organizations is massive. Uh, I don't know how it is in Sweden, but in Germany, if you are a manufacturer of any technical good, you are a member of Dean. It's normal, right? This is where you learn about technical developments. This is where you collaborate with others. So basically, they manage the whole industry. And they're one of the key collaborators. And that's why they have a lot of impact. Much more than we have. Because uh, we have impact very locally a lot in our software sector, in the sectors that we work in. But how do you reach machining companies? How do you make sure that machining companies' standards actually operate with the copyright? Because they're not coming to this conference. Any machine, machining company in the room? Proves my point. Okay. They also have weaknesses. There's something that's really funny. It's called the standards development habitus, right? I joked earlier about five years to retirement. Um, they're basically public servants. They're, they're administrators. People that engage in open source communities are usually enthusiastic about writing code. Right, that's why you're here. You're not here because you want to talk about bylaws and statutes and stuff like that. And um, it's really different there because the, the people that make a career out of working in these organizations, they're not, they're not working on technical projects anymore. 
they're working on running the organization. The organization becomes important in itself, and it becomes a good way to earn early retirement. So, um, which makes them a bit slow, in short. They have a bit ambiguous IPR policies. Anybody here uh, from a telecommunications company? Okay. Um, so, for example, we talked about this friend idea early on. Um, Standard setting organizations require, multiple, in many cases, participants to commit to such conditions. But they don't say what the conditions are, they say this should be negotiated in the market, in contracts, or maybe in court. Which is really weird because you require a commitment, but there's no commitment because it's not clear what you committed to. Um, and this is ambiguous, and this is a weakness, and that we see that, for example, in the telecommunications space and how it interacts with the free software community. The processes are cumbersome. Well, I don't think I need to explain this. And there are some outdated business models, like still today, in, in ISO, there's the ISO store, and you can swipe your credit card and buy a copy of the C++ standard. Did any of you do that? Of the C++ developers? Yeah, you don't need it because the drafts are all on GitHub. But the actual, like, approved document you have to buy. I think it's not very expensive, but it's still like, you're basically like buying a book. Um, and that's a key revenue source for many of the organizations. Um, anyway, long story short, these were the strengths and weaknesses of the two, the two constituencies that we analyzed. And now we're condensing it. We're saying, we're actually complements, we complement each other, and we're competing at the same time, but for different things. We create complementary products, open source implementations versus approved standards documents. Right? Um, and if you need specification and implementation, you need both. It doesn't matter if your community writes documentation or the standards development group. In the end, what you're doing is you're creating specifications and implementations. Um, and that's pretty complementary. Like, we would be very happy if the approved specification for our IoT frameworks come out of SEN. Why not? We don't have to do it. We're great. Um, however, our processes are really competing. And since every development effort has to choose either an open collaborative online process or a working group based process, you have to make a choice. You can't really, in the process, at the process perspective, from the process perspective, combine standards development and open source. You can combine, you can create the specification in a standards development process and the implementation in an open source process. But for each, you have to make a choice. Right? And that's why open source development doesn't successfully happen at standards development organizations, and usually we are not very good at producing approved specifications. So, yeah. So we're compl uh, complements or yeah, complementary and competitors at the same time. Which begs the question: How do we decide which process to apply and which to focus on first? Because this is how we started, right? We said. Um, there are these different models of like implementing first, specifying first. Mm -hmm. What determines which way we go, which path we choose through this model? The differentiator is called cost of change. And uh, I have two examples for this. Wi-Fi hardware and Linux, the kernel. We have, I think, 8.5 changes per hour in Linux in average in 2017. Integrated changes per hour in average, including Christmas, New Year's, and Easter holidays. So pretty good, right? And um, then you have like the interface to your Wi-Fi hardware. Um, so cost of change, if you find a bug in Linux, is super low, right? You submit a patch, it gets integrated, and then the machine starts rolling, and everybody in the world eventually will use the, the fixed code. If you find a bug in the Wi-Fi implementation in your hardware, that's difficult to replace. And this is this differentiator, which spans a continuum, and, and somewhere in the middle, in the imagined middle, is a point where you say cost of change is pretty much the same for hardware, like this and that way. And this is where you choose a parallel implementation model. If cost of change is very high, you specify first, because you spend a lot of time on specification to make sure that you don't have to change it later. And if cost of change is very low, you just focus on implementation, because you say, if I find a bug, I'll fix it. And I don't need a specification for that. It can get to a point where you actually don't specify anymore, like in the case of Linux, because you say, how, right? Our specification will be outdated 8.5 times per hour. So let's not do it. People can read the code. Um, yeah. 
And there's this aspect of like pace of innovation, which usually is inversely related to cost of change. If this sounds interesting to you, we're actually um, there's a German publication of this whole paper already, and uh, we're, it's coming out hopefully in IEEE software later this year. Um, so I said earlier, this is a SWOT analysis, so strengths and weaknesses, and compared for two constituencies, which makes it super interesting to talk about what if you look at the weaknesses of both sides? Because normally you would say, what is the, the comparable weaknesses, comparative weaknesses of one against the strengths of the other? What should this group focus on? What should this group focus on? But what we try to, put to, to uh, crystallize here is what are things that both of these constituencies can't really do very well? Um, both of us, for them and us, um, have trouble with dealing with early investment, heavy research and development. So processes where you take five, six, ten years before you even can produce a prototype. Um, no open source community works on this. None of us work on something that will you take for years, it will take years until you even have a working model. Um, however, that's also not something that is handled very well in standards development organizations, which is why we have this whole debate of standard essential patents, because the argument here is we need to give people standard essential patents so that they have the incentive to invest for 10 years before they can submit a new technology. Um, we have globalization in the sense that we globally uh, collaborate. However, um, we as the source community don't have a lot of influence, for example, at the policy making level. So we may collaborate globally, but we can't affect economic policy. Science development organizations can to an extent, but only nationally. So this whole trend of like global collaboration that I laid out earlier, none of us are serving it really well. And the case in point, if you think, but we are collaborating globally, we are, but it's clustered in language groups. There is very little collaboration between the Chinese-speaking open source community and the English-speaking open source community. There is very little collaboration between, um, I think, South American and the rest of the world. Because some of their software is written in Brazilian, Brazilian language. So, yeah. Um, so we still have a lot of work to do. And we talked earlier about the, the intellectual property rights of policies that um, setting organizations have um, deployed. Some of them are really old-fashioned, and, and ours, from the open source perspective, they're not fully evolved yet. That's why we have this trouble with supply chains, <laughs> license compliance, etc. Um, which means none of us has kind of reached global domination yet. We're all weaknesses in this space, and as a result, we, for example, have an endless debate about what is an open standard. We just can't get to an agreement what it is. Have you seen that? There are like 15 definition of, definitions of what an open standard is. And our, our definition is an open standard can be implemented as free software. But that's not the definition that everybody else is using. All right? There's a huge spectrum. What is friend, etc. So, and as I said, there's a, there's a paper on this that is uh, published in German language and will be published in English language later this year. And it's open access, of course, as it should be. So if you need more details on that, feel free to read it. And then there's this study ongoing, as I said, at the European Commission, Joint Research Center, on the interaction between open source software and front licensing. So very similar, what this indicates is that at the policy making level, there's awareness of this issue. And there's awareness that to make good policy, we should have a good empirical base on, what, on which we make the decisions. And this is the intention of that. So I really congratulate the Joint Research Center on saying, we'll just do this for two years first before we recommend anything to policymakers. And here are some intermediate results. First of all, what we did is we looked at um, existing interactions of, 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 of standardization and implementation. For example, the ECMAScript community, one of the most successful examples of collaboration between standards development and implementation. Um, the community, the implementer community is involved in standards development. There's a lot of collaboration in the sense of feedback from the developer community for new language features that make it into the new version of the language. I think there are about six months release cycles for language specifications. Excellent stuff. Um, similarly, the C++ working group, it's a bit more old-fashioned, right? It's like it's hosted at ISO, um, but the working models are pretty much the same, right? They publish their documents on GitHub, you can comment on them. Um, it's a bit slower, but yeah, we see the same thing in Java. It's uh, the Java community process, it's uh, 
like run like controlled by Oracle still, but it's at least a collaboration between the open source implementers. All the key implementations of Java these days are the free software licenses, um, etc. And we looked at many others. Um, and we see these three approaches, right? Specification first, languages, you have to specify first before you can implement them, clearly. Um, others lead with implementation, Cloud Foundry, OpenStack, etc., Kubernetes. Um, and then you have this parallel um, approach. And one thing that we found is that the, the parallel approach sometimes developed develop later. So they started with implementation, and then over time they became more and more collaborative, these groups. They, they invited feedback from the community, and then you have like rolling release cycle for ECMAScript, for example, which is a shift in the way a standard is developed. It used to be top-down, and now it's more rolling. Um, a very interesting thing that we learned is um, what is software versus governance? Because when JRC put out the request for the study, they asked, what's the interaction between open source software and what the standards development organizations do? And we said, you know, that's not the right question to ask. Because it's not a question of how the software licenses, it's a question of how does the community develop the software, it's a question of governance. And so we actually went and defined a lot of, like, provided actual definitions for things like the wider open source community, the upstream downstream network, the things I talked about today. Um, they're now written and documented and will be published as a report at JRC. So that um, I think this provides a whole new level of understanding how the wider open source community works. Because I think that mostly open source software was seen as a legal thing in the sense of it's software and open source license. Nobody really cared in a simple way of looking at it how it was developed. Right? And um, yeah, so we pointed out a lot that this was a question of governance, and then you may have heard of this the debate on legal compatibility between patent licensing and um, free software licenses. We said, yeah, but that will not fix the problem. Right? You can't make, you can't create legal compatibility and expect that now there will be collaboration, because in the end, um, this is a precondition, but people are participating voluntarily, and by participating voluntarily, um, they make a decision if they want to participate or not. And that is based on the welcoming level, welcomingness level of your community. Um, yeah, so this is maybe not surprising to us, um, but I believe it's it's good that this is documented at the policymaker level, right? Um, maybe some interesting details: uh, permanent license choices. There are there is a kind of process of uh, normalization of the licenses that we use. Um, these are all large scale projects. And we basically have the GPL family, some MIT, and a lot of them we use Apache 2. And we know that there are over 100 approved open source licenses. Um, the vast majority of them are mostly historical. Right? These days, all the new projects, if they're industry led, usually use Apache 2. And that's not a bad thing, because it simplifies collaboration. It makes it easier, because you don't have to read all the licenses. You just have to understand the ones that are relevant. Yeah. I spoke about the term governance before, there's another interesting observation, and that is that the term itself under, is understood in standards organizations as the legal framework. So the governance is the legal framework, and if you want to work with them, you read it, and you say, I agree, and I approve, and I will take part. And that's already said. For us, it's different. We develop governance as the mode of collaboration, and then later on we choose license and say, because we collaborate this way, this is released under the LGPL. Right? So you can't read the LGPL to understand how the community works, basically. But that's how standards development organizations would use the term governance, which is interesting, it's just in the question of nomenclature, of understanding the other side and what words they use and what they mean by that. And something as basic as governance has different meanings, <laughs> different contexts. There's another claim that is, uh, and that is that. Um, it's all nice and good if these like hackers in the open source community collaborate, maybe they can get 20 people together, but for real large collaboration you need a working group and standardization as uh, the guidance for the work. And we try to really undermine this claim by giving a couple of examples, for example a Cloud Foundry with uh, 4,000 individual participants, um, 70 companies and 400 different software modules were um, OpenStack in this case, with uh, 6,600 individual participants and over 300,000 commits. And that was interesting because that was unexpected. People really assumed that 
open source communities are like small decentralized groups. Um, standards development is where large scale collaboration happens. Um, we give them these numbers as a no. And there's another misconception, and that is um, open source is basically volunteer driven, and these are all hackers and students. That, that is prevalent still in, in many circles. So you believe we're all working in companies for decades, right? But the, the image is still the hacker in the basement that cranks out some code on the weekend. And so, yeah, we, we condensed this and we said most, most um, large scale communities today are industry led. They, are, they have a culture of voluntary participation. Right? They invite businesses to participate, volunteers as well. Um, they have meritocracy, but they also have membership fees, very similar to standard development organizations. Um, they have standardized governance norms. If you look at the, the charters of the different projects of the Linux Foundation, they're almost identical. And they all use Apache 2 as inbound and outbound license. And if you compare the charters of projects at Eclipse, they're actually also very similar. Um, so um, how the communities run their own operation has become more and more normalized. And that's on purpose because that makes it easier for you to join a community and contribute somewhere without having to like read the backlog for three years to see how they work. Um, there are some explicit statutes. They have IPR policies. This is also surprising to regulators. Um, because it's not a bunch of, bunch of hippies. Yeah, etc. So, um, I'm coming to a close here. We identified a, a shift in what a standard is. Um, so the old understanding of what a standard is, it enables competition between implementers. Maybe it enables interoperability. But our communities sometimes say, yeah, standards mitigate cost of change. That is still like a continuum of uh, like more stand pro standards arguments. Um, the joint implementation is the standard. We see this a lot in, in our environment, where we say there's one product, everybody uses it, and it's free software. Why would we create another complementary and compatible product to it? That just creates friction. Um, or the harsh kind of counter extreme is specification leads to fragmentation. We don't create specifications because then people make competing implementations instead of collaborating with us. This is quoted from uh, Automotive Grid Linux. And my final perplexing argument is that free software is a state-of-the-art commodity. Do you know these terms, state-of-the-art and commodity? Is that understandable? Right. Normally, you say either something is state-of-the-art, so it's innovative and cool, or it's commodity, it's boring and it's mass produced. However, um, our business model is to collaborate to save research and development costs and distribute to many parties. So what we do is investment heavy research and development. That's why we get together. We don't want to do the investment ourselves. So it's state of the art. Everything we create is made by the best software engineers in the world. So why wouldn't it be? And it's innovative. And it's non-differentiating us. Really? Because it's not non-differentiating because everybody has access to it. So it doesn't give you a competitive edge over him because he can use the same code. And this is where policymakers they fall over. They say, well, we either have differentiating in state of the art or we have commodity. It's not the same. Well, it is. So it's a commodity and the public good. Wow. And then you have a very quiet room of people with PhDs in economics. <sighs> And then here's the last key aspect of free software. We have no negotiation. I don't know if you ever thought about this much. I didn't before I did this like very theoretical work. Um, but the key differentiator for us, bet between us and say large industry collaborations based on standards, is that none of us negotiate over using the other people. We have end faculty licensing relationships, and we don't care because it's all automatic. And um, this is not necessarily an open source related argument. This is an argument about the transaction cost of participation, if you look at it from an economic perspective. And this is why there's a certain limit on how many parties can participate if you have negotiation, and we don't have that limit. And this is why we out collaborate the others. All right. So let me close. Give me two minutes. Um, how is this relevant? I gave you like a huge rundown of like current economic discussions, patterns, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but this is actually being discussed in, in Brussels and in your, in your countries and globally and at the United Nations uh, at the moment. For example, still today there's an innovation metric 
where people say they compare the innovativeness of com companies, uh, sorry, countries, by how many patent applications are written in this country. And we say, well, the open source community never writes any patents. Right? So, for example, annual R&D budget, number of patents filed, etc. Those are still metrics, and we're arguing against using this as metrics for innovation because it makes no sense whatsoever anymore. Um, there's a very interesting debate ongoing about what's the definition of open source. So here's a quote from our interview participant saying, why do you only reference the open source initiative's definition of open source in your interviews? Our answer was because that is the definition of open source. Um, but people said, no, 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 we disagree. That's just one organization, and we have our own definition of open source, and it doesn't include patent rights, and you can't use this stuff commercially. So this is still ongoing. This is not done with. Um, there's a very polarized debate at the moment that tries to frame open source as a descriptive term. Descriptive term means it has no meaning except the two words, open and source. Um, versus state of the uh, term of the art, term of art, where you say it has a complete com concrete meaning, which is the open source definition. And needless to say, some industry players would prefer it to be not based on the open source definition because they can f like mangle the words and then name things, call things open source that aren't. And uh, we also see a very polarized debate that postulates open source as a framework only for copyright management, um, as opposed to a mode of collaboration. Uh, this is kind of going on behind the scenes, because the debate has been taken to places where we usually do not participate. Regulation, the Directorate General for Growth in the European Union, uh, the European Commission, Standards Development Organizations, um, etc., etc. And these are not places where we as the wider open source community are usually present. And this is basically my call to action here in this room, is make sure that you know where the, where the battles are happening and that we're at the table. In Brussels, in Stockholm, in Berlin, that's what we need to do. Thank you.